good morning. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church as we can come to the, the close of summer. And we're glad to have you here as we worship this beautiful uh, summer Sunday. We're glad to have uh, uh, cloudless skies, right? Uh, praise the Lord for that and uh, dry out some hopefully today in the coming days. But we're glad to have you here as we worship together. If you're visiting with us for the first time, uh, if we could ask, act, ask you to do one small favor for us, you should find a visitor card in the pew rack in front of you. If you could fill that out. And drop in the offering plate when it comes by later. We'd appreciate it. Uh, just give us a chance to connect with you and answer any questions you might have about our church family. Uh, we just appreciate that, that small favor if you would uh, do that for us. Just a, a few announcements. I'd encourage you to, to read your bulletin as you have a chance as we uh, have a few end of summer activities coming up here soon. Uh, just a few I want to point out. We do have our last uh, outdoor movie this Friday, and it's uh, Sherlock Gnomes. Uh, I can say personally, it's a great movie, uh, so come on out and join us this Friday for that final movie night uh, out in the back parking lot. I, knew, I know you'll enjoy it. We also begin uh, this Sunday uh, for orders for our student discipleship program, so if you have a preschooler, a grade schooler, or somebody in our youth program, uh, we'll be taking orders down in our lobby, so I'd encourage you to stop in there uh, to fill out all the registration information and order your material. We also have uh, the ability to order online, um, so we have uh, instructions for that as well. Um, but uh, also, if, if you don't have a regular quiet time that you use personally, uh, I'd encourage you to stop in. They have uh, quiet times that can be used uh, for adults as well. Uh, but be sure to look at the other announcements in your bulletin as you have a chance later today. As we uh, continue in worship this morning, I want to turn our attention to the Scriptures. And uh, Psalm 117 tells us, Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol Him, all peoples. For great is His steadfast love towards us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together as we do that. Father, we thank You for Your kindness, for Your faithfulness, and Lord, I pray that as we gather in this time and sing of your, your faithfulness, not just to us, but to Christians gathered around the globe on this Lord's Day, Father, uh, we pray that you would renew us and prepare us for uh, the week ahead, that we be, might be reminded not just in these moments, but in days to come, that you are good and that your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
As we uh, continue in worship this morning with a time of prayer, let me reiterate what, uh, what David said and just thank you for those who served in the Clothes for Kids ministry. It certainly is a, a blessing to serve those in our community. And we want to pray as well for the, the children and the families that were served. Uh, what a great opportunity to minister uh, to, to them. And so I'd encourage you, uh, if, if you served as part of that, remember those that you were able to serve and pray for them in the coming days. Uh, those children, as they were those clothes and their families, uh, you know, what a great reminder uh, weekly and daily as they put those clothes on of, of the love of Christ and, and of the ministry that's happening in this area. So thank you, and, and I'd encourage you to keep praying and to keep serving in those ways. Uh, just a couple other items to, to keep in prayer uh, as, as you pray this week. Keep uh, Pat Henry in your prayers as Pat continues to recover from her liver transplant, and uh, everything seems to be going well, but continue to pay, pray for Pat, and also for Mike Gilbert. Mike will have uh, surgery this week, and so pray for Mike and, and Beverly as they uh, look towards that surgery. And of course, we want to pray for those uh, that were impacted by the flooding this week, uh, such a, an immediate and significant event. And we want to remember those that are still uh, cleaning out wet areas of homes and, and for some that, that just don't have homes to go back to. Uh, so be in prayer for that and uh, some of your neighbors and, and some of those even sitting in, in uh, our congregation today. So uh, just a few items to keep in prayer as you have opportunity uh, this week. But as we continue in worship this morning, uh, let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we, uh, we come to worship you in your, in your holiness, in your greatness. That we, uh, there's so many other things that we're in awe of. Uh, this week in our area, we, we were in awe of the, the power of, of nature. But Father, we're reminded that even you are greater than, than that. That on the on a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee with one word. Uh, Christ spoke it still. And so Father, when we sing of your greatness, that you sent Christ to die, we truly dare can take it in. That your love is that great and, and your compassion is never-ending. So Father, I pray that as we gather, that is uh, a truly impacting us in these ways. And Father, I ask that you would uh, guide us as we worship. Uh, we pray for these requests that uh, I've mentioned this morning, and we thank you for those that have served through Clothes for Kids. We thank you more for those who are impacted, and we pray that the ministry would continue to bear fruit down the road and, and even today as, as they prepare for the school year ahead, Lord, that they would be reminded of why we do that ministry, of the love of Christ that has changed us and that we seek to see change them. Lord, we pray for Pat Henry and Mike Gilbert uh, one recovering from a significant surgery and, and Mike preparing for surgery. We pray that your mercies and your grace would uh, ever flow for each. And Father, we pray for those still recovering from um, our flooding in this area. We, we thank you for first responders who blessed us greatly Thursday evening. Pray that you would continue to provide and direct in the days ahead for those who are impacted. And Lord, now as, as we continue in worship, we, we thank you for the ability to lift our voices in praise, to, to pray to a God we know hears us. And Father, we now ask you as we look into your word that you would give us wisdom. We need it. God, our hearts. Father, we pray especially for those who gather with us who aren't Christians, that things would be clear and and they would be able to understand that I wouldn't get in the way. That, Father, you would work as only you can and bring, bring life among the dead. So, Father, now guide us. What we don't know, teach us. And what we don't see, show us. 
that we might leave changed by the power of the gospel. Lord, we ask that you do this in the name of Jesus Christ, in his name that we do pray. Amen. <clears throat> Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 116. Psalm 116, if you're using the, the Pew Bible, you'll find that in page 510. Psalm 116, uh, beginning in verse 1, and we'll read it together this morning. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me, the pangs of Sheol laid hold on me, I suffered distress and anguish, then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed. Even when I spoke, I'm greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people in the courts of the house of the Lord in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. This is the word of our God. It, it may be different for you, uh, but sometimes as I read through the Psalms, uh, there, there's a kind of an internal conflict that can sometimes come up because you, you read how they handle struggles. And uh, sometimes you wonder if they live in the same world that we do, that they can face challenges and extreme challenges, significant challenges, and it's, it's almost like they flip this switch as if uh, it, it's all gone away with one very simple and sometimes very insignificant action or change. And sometimes for me, uh, there is this idea of was the world that much different for them? Was it more simple? Was it less complicated? Were they dealing with items that we don't necessarily deal with where, where they could just move on from things that for many of us become long-term, long-standing, internal, personal struggles? I think that's one of the, the, the challenges uh, of handling the Scriptures is that we sometimes think that our troubled existence, our difficulties, somehow aren't those of the people around us. That we're alone. That we're unique in dealing with those matters. And what's helpful in coming back to the scriptures is that you're reminded that there's a, a benefit to identify the, the troubling nature of just being alive. That if there's breath in your lungs, there is difficulty in your life. I had a, a high school football coach named Alexander Rousseau. He taught 11th grade English, and he coached uh, freshman football. And what made Alexander Rousseau unique was that when he was in college, he was in a motorcycle accident that caused him to lose his right arm. So here was a one-armed, very uh, zealous, outspoken, somewhat rough-and-tumble 
English teaching football coach. And a lot of people would look at Coach Rousseau and begin to define him by his limitations. That when you're a one-armed man on a football field, there's some things you just can't do. And it's difficult to interact. And so the first practice, some people would try to go easy around him and, and not do certain things and carry out certain drills with him. And you would find out very quickly that he didn't appreciate that much when you were on your back looking up after he had hit you in the middle of your chest. See, a lot of people would try to define him based on his troubles, based on his difficulties. And what he had made a decision to do very early after his accident was to begin to see the benefits of his troubles that he told us regularly. I can do a one-arm push-up. How many of you can? I can tie my shoelaces with one hand. How many of you can? And this isn't much to brag about, but I can drive a stick shift, drink a cup of coffee, and smoke a cigarette all at once. How many of you can? (laughs) He, He was able to reframe his overall understanding of life, knowing that his troubles weren't something to impede him. When we come to the scriptures, that's one of those pieces that we we have to come into grips with. That the Bible is constantly putting before us these parallel messages. One is that we're guaranteed a troubled existence. That the life that we live does not operate optimally. That as a result of the fall, if you go back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3, the world was created in perfection. It was created without sin. It was created without disobedience. But because of the actions of our original parents, the world is not how God intended it to be. It does not operate optimally. And so difficulty and conflict and disobedience and sin and disease and sickness are all realities that we face. And if you, if you look here at Psalm 116, the, the psalmist is describing a season of personal struggle in which he was near death. He's describing the impact of the fall on his own life. And for many of us, we have to embrace that reality that the the troubles that we face are not figments of negative thinking. The difficulties you face don't occur because you're not thinking positively enough. It's because we live in a fallen world. It's not a factor of your personality. It's not a factor of your failures always but it's a factor of the fallenness of our world. But parallel to that throughout the Scriptures is the reality that the Lord remains faithful in this troubled existence and extends His grace to sinners in this troubled existence. That God didn't look down and say, well, if you can't listen to me, enough with all you guys, I'm done with this. But that from the very beginning in Genesis 3, God set out a plan to redeem and renew that which he had lost. That he would send a Savior, a Savior who's Jesus Christ, to make sure that those who were given over to a troubled existence would have the promise of an eternity that was far better, free of sin and the curse, and all of these pieces that day by day remind us that life is not optimal. And that friend, if you're, you're here today and you're, you're not a Christian, most of what's going to come next in the rest of this sermon assumes that you've embraced that message. What the psalmist declares in Psalm 116 assumes that you're a child of God. That you've seen the troubled existence that we face 
You've recognized your own part in that troubled existence and your own sin. You've repented of it and you've put your belief and faith in Jesus Christ. That when we do that, God provides us with a grace, not just for ultimate victory, but for the, the provision of daily strength to sustain us in the pressures of this existence day by day. That as those troubles come before us, God gives us what we need to keep going. You see it in verse 12. This is really the, the center of the whole psalm. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? That if, if we recognize our troubled existence, but we don't recognize God's work and provision of grace, that verse can be left with a very empty answer. See, friends, what we need is the very thing that the psalmist offers us. We need to know how do we access the provision of daily strength that we can see the benefits of the Lord and give him the praise that's due to him. Because that's what the psalmist is doing here. He's recognizing God's benefits to him, and he's turning them back to him in praise. And when we face the troubles of our reality... That's the very response that the Bible calls us to do. See the benefits that God has provided and give him the praise due to him because of those things. Uh, Look at how the psalmist responds this way uh, here in Psalm 116. We, We see first how he identifies the benefits that are true regardless of that troubled existence that the psalmist in these opening 11 verses reminds us of a, of a number, at least three, benefits that the Lord provides to his people. First, the Lord hears. Those first four verses, he's, he's framing God's listening ear within his covenant blessings, that he hears his people, he inclines himself towards his people, and he delivers his people. Th- those are not benefits due to random members of the population. God just doesn't hear anybody. He doesn't just incline himself towards anybody. God just doesn't deliver anybody. Those are specific benefits directed towards the children of God. And that if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, that's why it's so necessary to understand the base element of what we call the gospel, the good news. Because the promises we find in the Scripture aren't just tossed freely over the general population. God directs them towards His children. And friends, that's why for us that are Christians... We have to see the preciousness of a God who hears us. We can't see it as a minor element. If you look just in the story of Scripture, just in the flow of Scripture, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. It's a great bedtime story if you have boys, right? Gets them really calmed down for bed. But it's during the reign of Ahab and his wonderful wife Jezebel. And she's led the people away from the Lord and to, to worship the, pro, the, the god Baal. And Elijah, the prophet of God, comes forward and declares that this is heresy. This is, this is false religion. And the people of God need to come back to worshiping the Lord. And so he basically calls for a, a royal rumble, Right? good old WWF style, Royal Rumble, on on Mount Carmel. We're going to set up a a brawl where the prophets of Baal have to pray that their God would send fire to consume their sacrifice. And they set up an altar and they put their sacrifice on it and they pray all day and they cut themselves and they scream out to their God and they do all this crazy stuff all day. And Baal never once answers their cries. What's great about the story is Elijah just sits there and trash talks him. Is he going potty? Did he go on vacation? Maybe you're not yelling loud enough. He can't hear you. They finally give up and Elijah says, okay, my turn. He rebuilds the altar, puts the sacrifice on the altar, and then he tells them, this isn't difficult enough for my God. So he pours water on it and more water, and more water. So there's a trench of water around the altar. Elijah gets down on his knees, 
prays one prayer, fire falls from heaven to consume the sacrifice, the altar, and laps up the water around the altar, the scriptures tell us. Our God hears. Friends, that's the preciousness of this, that other religions try to posture themselves and do things to try to manipulate their God into inclining himself towards his people. You can go around the world today and you'll find false religions where people are doing all kinds of crazy stuff, trying to get their God to listen to them. We serve a God who turns his ear towards his people. It's a precious thing. A great reformer, Martin Luther, uh, we're reading a book together as a staff, and this week it retold the story of Luther's trip to Rome and how he, he was climbing the Lateran steps. The Lateran steps were the steps that were supposedly moved from Jerusalem to Rome, the steps that Pontius Pilate stood on to declare uh, his verdict on Jesus. And Roman Catholics were told that if you would climb these steps on your knees, you would gain pardon for yourself or for a loved one, whether alive or dead, to get straight to heaven. The story is told that Luther climbed those steps on his knees and got to the top and came to that great realization that the righteous shall not live by this craziness. The righteous shall live by faith. Why? Because our God hears He doesn't need us to do crazy things before him. He doesn't need to be manipulated. He hears the voice of his people. Friends, that's a precious thing. That you need not posture before our God. We know that because he doesn't just just hear, but as the psalmist tells us in verses 5, 6, and 7, he cares. It'd be a vicious thing to have somebody who hears you but does not have your best interest at heart, does not show some sense of care and compassion. And the benefit of the Lord is a heart filled with compassion toward those who least deserve it. The psalmist in verse 6 refers to himself among the simple. If you look at this word in its usage throughout the scriptures, and specifically its usage in the book of Proverbs, the word is used negatively. In the book of Proverbs, the word simple is translated sometimes similar to this as the word simpleton, but more often the word we're used to, and that some of you would probably chastise your children for using, the word fool. What the psalmist is doing here is he's reinforcing not his own lack of value, but he's reinforcing the Lord's humility. That the God of heaven gives himself to and shows compassion towards those who are seemingly unworthy. If we look at our lives compared to God's wisdom, We can tell long stories of being simpletons, being foolish. What does God do? God hears us, and God shows compassion towards us. An old Puritan writer described it like this, that it's a great thing to know from our own experience that we have a reconciled Father in heaven who cares for us and though infinitely exalted, hears the cry of poor, troubled mortals. That he cares. The friends, the, the ruler of the heavens inclines his ear towards those of us who are his people. We don't have to prove to him that we're worthy. He knows we're not. That when we lift our voices up and say, Our Father who is in heaven, it should be a reminder of the level of love that's shown towards us. 
That's why it's... I've talked to some whose relationship with their earthly father was extremely negative. And if if that's you, let, let me encourage you. The wrong thing to do is to shy away from fatherly language in the scriptures. Some people say, well, my relationship with my father was bad, so it's hard for me to refer to God as father. That's the wrong way to approach it. Don't let a bad earthly father keep you from seeing the wonderful hearing, compassionate, loving Father that you have as a child of God. Do the opposite. Let your experiences be undone by the truth of the God who hears, of the God who cares, and third, of the God who acts. In verses 8 through 11, the, the psalmist tells us that God does things, that he acts on behalf of his people. And, and as experience reminds us, the Lord may not act as we desire, but he always acts. He always acts. I was reminded as I was working through this of a, of a dear saint that uh, has gone to be with the Lord in, in our church family, and uh, she went through a long and difficult struggle with cancer. And I remember sitting with her and her husband some years ago and hearing them both reinforce, we, we know God will act. We know God will work. We, we know God will heal. We just don't know how. But regardless of how, we know he's good. We know he loves us. We know it's right. Friend, that's, that's what we have here. If you look at verses 10 and 11, that's, that's the challenge. The, the psalmist is saying, I'm afflicted. I'm surrounded by those who tell me I'm crazy. That's his statement there in verse 11. All mankind are liars. We've all had those experiences where we're declaring our faith. We're declaring that we believe the Lord cares. We believe the Lord hears. We believe the Lord acts. And you even have family members who tell you, oh, you're just numbing yourself with that religious speak. Maybe okay for you to believe that stuff, but we live in reality. The psalmist is saying that's not a new experience. We're always going to have people that tell us that this stuff is just a bunch of hooey. And the reality is, is that in those moments, we have to preach to our own souls. Very front of verse 10 I believed. I believed when I spoke to myself, I'm greatly afflicted. I believed when I looked around and said all mankind were liars. So we have to make a declaration of faith in these moments to say, I believe. Alec Matia has a great commentary. It's actually a daily devotional on the Psalms. Uh, If you're looking for a devotional, I encourage you to get it. uh, Psalms by the day. Um, he makes this comment on verse 6. It's not a thing we always do. Yet what a lesson to learn. To look into the teeth of the storm and say, I believe. Come what may, this is not going to knock me off course. Here I stand. Here I stand. That I have a God who hears me. I have a God who cares for me. I have a God who will act. Friends, these are the blessings of our God. This is is the benefit that we see in times of trouble. And and often we let our eyes closed. And more often so we get them clouded by the the, the voices and the actions of others. And in the Psalms, the, the Bible as a whole, are such a necessary resource because there's this constant refrain to lift our eyes from the troubles of our lives to the one who hears and the one who cares and the one who will act. Just, just a few Psalms over. Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. 
The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Friends, this is our God. It's not that He provides us with benefits. He is our benefit. See Him. And when we see Him, we we give Him the praise that He's due. If you you look at verses 12 through the end, that's what the psalmist is doing. That's why verse 12 is so important. Because when he begins to ask that question, he's taking all those benefits and he's, he's flipping them back to God. And if we ask, how can I repay God for the benefit of himself, for all of those those other blessings that we see, the response is with praise. Praise. And praise at its core that adds nothing to God. Adds nothing to God. One of, the, one of the great traps to see the benefits of God is to think, okay, well, what do I have to offer since he's given me all this stuff? He's done all this wonderful work for me. I, I certainly have to give something back. And so many of us get, can get caught into that trap. And what ends up happening, happening is either you don't come, you rob yourself of worship, or you come in the wrong way. You come thinking that you have to bring something to the Lord that's of value. You have to bring something back to Him because of how He's blessed you. Hit delete, right? Highlight it. Delete it. Get rid of it. Garbage. That's what that is. It's it's garbage religion. Nonsense when it comes to the Scriptures. And and you can see it here in the psalmist's words. Verse 12 is a question of giving. What shall I render to the Lord for all of His benefits? What can I give back? And if you look at the immediate verse following it, verse 13, His response is to give back nothing but to take more from God. I'm going to lift up the cup of salvation. Well, what's the cup of salvation? It's merely something that he's gotten from the Lord. And I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. Why is he calling on the name of the Lord? Because when he lifts up his cup, it's going to be emptied. How does he get it refilled? He calls on the name of the Lord to refill it. So what we have here is him saying, what do I give to the Lord? Why well, give to him the only thing I really have, which is everything he's given to me. Friends, that's the base of our praise. We recognize we have nothing to give to him, nothing to add to him, so we just reflect back to him everything that he's given to us. Uh, we, this is not a reflection of of my parenting in any way, but our youngest son, Silas, is a, is a wonderful reflection of this, that when we give Silas money, uh, they have chores, and they get a small amount because we know inflation over the years is going to have to increase that amount uh, to do those chores. And when Silas is given money, he doesn't know how to keep that money. He'll get the money, and he'll go try to find somebody to give it to. Now, his older siblings don't have this problem. They have mastered the, uh, the, the character of keeping the money, right? But Silas will get the money, and he'll try to find somebody to give it to. And probably the, the, the one time that will most stand out to me is uh, I was at the table opening mail, and the kids know that Daddy gets two kinds of mail, junk and bills. Mommy gets all the good stuff. Silas got his allowance, and I was at the table opening bills, and Silas took his allowance and set it down next to me and said, here, Daddy, use this to pay your bills. 
Yeah, oh, yeah. I took it the next day and put it in the checking account, yeah. <laughs> Just kidding, no. But, 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 but that's, you know, I, I pray he never loses that part of his character. But he's quick to turn it over because he, has, he knows it's not his. Friends, that's the heart of praise. That we, we recognize that these benefits that humble us and, and that they've come to the simple and, and when we recognize these matters, it's easy to turn them back to God. Uh, there's a song that I love. It's, it's entitled, My Worth is Not in What I Own. And there's a, a couple verses go like this. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. The closing stanza goes like this. Two wonders here that I confess, my worth and my unworthiness, my value fixed, my ransom paid at the cross. Friends, when, when we see the benefit that God has given us in Christ, the praise we render back to him is the most freeing and wonderful experience that we could ever have. And it's, it's a great service to our own souls and to the souls around us. Those closing verses, that's really what they're all about. That the, the worship of the people of God when they're responding to the blessings of God is a worship that serves others that when others hear us praising God for his benefit, it reminds us of our value to the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And it frees us all to worship him freely. Friends, the, the troubles that we face require us to worship. Uh, we, we come knowing we have nothing for the Lord, we come knowing that we have nothing for one another, but when we look to his benefits, when we look to who he is and what he's done, we can turn them back to him, and it's a great gift to our souls and to those around us. So friends, let's worship. When you come in here week by week, some of the pictures that drive me crazy are when people are at uh, fireworks shows and everybody's got their camera out taking videos and pictures. I want to yell through the screen, put down your phone and be. Friends, when we come to worship, put down the barriers the concerns that people might see, your struggles, and your brokenness, and your difficulty, and the reality, and just be. Give him praise for how he's worked in all his ways. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? Let's give him everything we have. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for who you are and what you've done. Father, we know we're among the simple, those who don't deserve, those who can't provide. But Father, you fill our cups. We pray that we would lift them with humble hands and worship calling out for you to refill them. Father, do this work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Our hymn of response is a, is a prayer. It's a prayer for God to, uh, to come with us and, and to settle with us and, and to assure us of his presence. And I wonder, friend, if, if that's a prayer that, that you're ready to pray this morning. As, as Christians, are, are we stable in the benefits that God provides to us, stable enough to give him the praise that he's due.
regardless of your struggle, regardless of your burden. Take these moments uh, to give back to him the praise for all the work, all the good that he's done to us as his people. But friend, if you're here this morning and that's not the reality of your life and heart, I wonder if in these moments you would abide with him for the first time and give your life to him through repentance and faith. But whatever decision you need to make, I pray you do it as we stand together and sing. Let's stand.